So now that we've seen a number of interesting creatures and seen some weird traits that seem to be relating uh, each creature to the other, I want to return to this one and look at another feature, a skeletal feature, and that's this feature right here. You see this? We have the legs. Now, as we saw before, we have the humerus, the ulna, the radius, the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, the scapula, all of that forming this arm. Down here, we have a similar sort of pattern. If you note here, we have the pelvis, and then the pelvis is attached to this bone here, which is the femur. And then we have a tibia and a fibula. The tibia is here and fibula is there. And then we got these bones down here, which are kind of like our ankle bones. In fact, they are ankle bones. And those are called tarsals. And then we have metatarsals and then phalanges as well. But there's a bone right here. You see that right there? That is a series of fused vertebrae. The vertebrae are these bones here that form the backbone together. Each one of these is separate, except right here. They're fused. And you notice the pelvis is attached right there to that fused bone right there. So that collection of fused vertebrae right where the pelvis is attached is referred to as a sacrum. Now, that sacrum is what allows the legs to lift the backbone. You have one too. Right at the base of your spine is, the, is a collection of bones that are all fused together, and they are attached to your pelvis so that when you stand up, you can use your legs to physically lift your whole body up. Same thing with this ambulocetus. That leg is connected to the pelvis, the pelvis is connected to the sacrum, and then that allows the animal to lift its body. And that's why we know the animal can walk on land. Interestingly enough, all creatures that can walk on land have that sacrum because that's required to stabilize that joint and allow the pelvis to actually lift the, the backbone. But now let's go all the way back down here to this bacillosaur. Okay, now look here. If you look here, you'll see a pelvis and a little miniaturized leg. You see that? So there's a miniature leg here. This bacillosaur has a miniature leg, even though we know the bacillosaur is something that could swim like this. Interesting, it has legs. So if we look at it and we go here and look carefully at it, this is coming from a, re a, a resource uh, of the researchers that actually studied one of these in great detail. And what they found was that there is a pelvis, that the ilium is part of the pelvis. There's the femur, which is the upper thigh bone. And then you have the tibia and the fibula. You have the tarsals right here, the metatarsals right here, and then the phalanges here. And notice it even has a kneecap. So this creature has a kneecap and a leg, but it's miniaturized compared to the rest of all of this. So that's an interesting sort of thing. Why is it this thing has little tiny miniature legs? Well, that's related to this. Let's go back up to the right whale. Look at this. Right here in the right whale. Even though the whale itself does not have hind limbs, it has a pelvis and it has a femur and remains of those hind limbs, but they're entirely encased within the body. So the hind limbs don't stick out, except occasionally we find uh, whales and dolphins which, with every now and again a flipper in the back, but that's it and that's what this creature has. Now these things are bones that are entirely like our bones. They're clearly legs. They're made by, from the same genes. The genes that produce our legs and our pelvis and all of that are the same that this creature has. But they're not even attached to the backbone in any way. Now, if we go back down to the bacillosaur, notice there's no sacrum. This bacillosaur has no sacrum whatsoever. And again, if we're looking at the actual bacillosaur here. Look, there's no sacrum. There's, that, there's no sacrum, but there's the little pelvis and all the rest of the bones in the hind limbs. So... What is going on? Why does this thing that swims in the water have little tiny miniaturized legs? And why is it that modern whales and dolphins have leg bones embedded in their body? Why is that? That's another pattern we have to try to understand. So these kinds of patterns here, when you look at them, these patterns uh, tend to be found in most organisms. This type of pattern where you have something that is no longer functioning as it does at least in other organisms, but it still appears to be there. Like in this case, whatever these things are, these bones that are the remains of the hind limbs, which we know are hind limbs because they're made by the same genes that make our hind limbs, they're definitely not hind limbs. This creature doesn't even have them. Those things are called vestigial traits or vestiges. Okay, so this is a vestigial trait. A vestigial trait is a part of the body that is typically imperfectly formed and it's not able to function as we see it in other organisms. Now, those are physical traits, but we also have vestigial genes as well. We call those pseudogenes. These are genes in 
that you have in your body, like one we've already talked about, the SEMA gene. That's a gene that's in your body that's broken, doesn't work, but it's in chimpanzees and gorillas and the other great apes and so on. The SEMA gene is actually even in mice. So you have genes from other species in your genome that are broken versions of those genes. Now we're going to study those later in the third unit. This is an example of a physical version of a vestigial trait. The pseudogenes are an example of a genetic or molecular version of a, of a vestigial trait. The thing about vestigial traits is this. They're very, very common. We see them in every species, every single species, except maybe bacteria. We can argue about that. But every eukaryotic species we've ever looked at, we find either vestigial molecular genes or we find vestigial traits or usually both. There are a number of other patterns that we need to try to explain. They're all related to each other. Here's another example. What do you think this is? What kind of creature are we looking at here? Now, if we look at this, this is all the same species. These are just various stages of growth and development of embryos. Okay, now these are embryos, remember. An embryo is defined as an individual with, that is, or a developing organism that has structures that you can identify. Here are some structures. There's the front limb, there's the hind limb, there's the tail. We're starting to see the formation of the brain and the eye, and we're starting to see the formation of the hind, uh, the front limb here, and the hind limb, which is circled, and you'll see. And each one of these things, these Carnegie stages, are just standardized stages for embryos. But it's not a fetus yet because without being an expert, you can't really tell what this creature is. So what is this thing? Okay, one thing I can tell you is it's, it's a mammal. We know it's a mammal. It actually does develop hair it's, uh, in later stages. And there is one clue here that can help us understand what this creature actually is. Notice, again, it has gills. Those are the gill arches. and We've seen those before in previous lectures. How do we know they're gills? Well, because they're developed being in the same way that gills develop in fish, and they develop from the same genes. The genes that develop the gills in fish also develop these uh, structures. But here's the clue. You see how the hind limb begins to develop here, and then it regresses, and the hind limb disappears. So the hind limb starts to form, but then stops, and it eventually regresses. So why is that? Hmm. Well, the reason is that this creature right here is developing into one of these. And it's a pantropical spotted dolphin, Stenella attenuata. And there's the mom and there's the baby. And that is the reason why the hind limbs disappear. The hind limbs start to form. And they even do continue to grow, but they stop growing big. And so they no longer are extending out from the, the, uh, the embryo. The embryo essentially grows around that uh, 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 structure, and that's why it is that we end up with hind limbs in living whales. This is a right whale again, and there's its hind limbs. So, this thing does not have any hind limbs except it has bones from its hind quarters uh, that form the legs and the pelvis and that kind of stuff. It's all there, except that it's so tiny that it doesn't even extend past the animal's body. So, this is kind of interesting. And like I said, this creature is going to have hair. It's going to be covered with hair in a little bit. And not only that, but here's a develop, Here's a much later fetus. And you'll notice it has these little bumps right here. And guess what's sticking out of each one of these bumps? It's a whisker. Just like a dog or a cat have those whiskers sticking out of here. This guy, this attenuata, this is the exact same species, pantropical uh, spotted dolphin. And this thing right here has these things that regress. Again, it develops whiskers like a cat or a dog or even a cow. It develops whiskers on those things but the whiskers then disappear. Notice the adult doesn't have any whiskers at all. That's just a perfectly smooth body, no fur, no hair. This is a complete smooth thing. It doesn't have hair. Now remember we said that hair was a synapomorphic trait for mammals, and we call this a mammal. Why is that a mammal? It doesn't have hair, ah, but it did in the later stage fetus, and it has these hair uh, uh, structures here. Whiskers are formed from hairs, and Therefore, it's a mammal. It feeds its young with milk, and it had hair, but then it loses it. So there's another pattern we have to try to understand. This is a vestigial trait. These whiskers are vestigial, and these hind limb buds are also vestigial. Why do they form when the adult creature doesn't need them or use them at all? It doesn't even have them. Why do they form in the embryo? Yet another question we have to try to answer. So there's one final pattern that I want to show you. And that's this. If we take all the species that we've looked at so far, 
endohyus and ambulocetus and basilosaurus and modern whales and dolphins. And we lay them out by the time that we find their earliest fossils. Now, in other words, we date the fossils. We can figure out how long things have been fossilized uh, through a number of different geochemical techniques and geophysical techniques. If we look at the earliest fossils of each one of these types of creatures, we find that Indohyus, which remember had hooves and an involucrum, is about the earliest fossils were about 55 million years ago. Ambulocetus is about 49 million years ago, so more recent. So this is a younger fossil than this one. And even younger than that is Bacillosaurus, that's 41 million years. And then even younger than that are the earliest modern fossils of whales and dolphins, which is about 36 and a half million years ago. So if you lay them out like this, look at the pattern. It looks like all of these are connected by a synapomorphic trait. The involucrum of their ear is one example. There's a number of others, which I haven't shown you. But they're connected by these synapomorphic traits, the involucrum, that, that fold that goes all through here. And also remember, this had hoofs, and this also had hoofs, but these hooves were little teeny tiny things. In fact, I hadn't used this term before, but now we can use it. The hooves on this creature's uh, digits are vestigial. They're not true hooves anymore. These are. These are functional hooves, but these aren't. They're just like little tiny hooves that are at the end of the, of the bones. So if we look at it as a time series, it looks as if things are changing from one form to another, and that these are connected through common descent, their family lineages. So creature like this can give rise to a creature like this, can give rise to a creature like this, can give rise to a creature like this. It's not exactly what we're going to argue, but that's what it kind of looks like when we, when we lay these fossils out and we look at them in terms of their time. But not only that, this idea of common descent, that these creatures all descended from a common ancestor, can help explain the patterns that we saw. For example, it can help explain why it is that whales and dolphins have essentially an arm, a hand, in their flipper, because it would have arisen from an earlier ancestor that had an arm that is typical of, of all of the vertebrates. Okay, and if we look at the, at, the, at the tetrapods, anyway, the creatures that walk on land on four, on four legs, which includes mammals and reptiles and amphibians and things like this, they all have that same basic body plan. Why? Because they came from common descent. The creatures were not created from scratch. They were created from earlier creatures. If they were created from earlier creatures, that would explain why it is that the basic patterns are the same, even though a flipper is completely different from a leg that runs and walks from a hand that grasps and climbs. It's the same basic pattern because we inherited it from a common ancestor. Why is it that Ambulocetus had hooves? If it came from a creature somewhat like Indohyus, then it inherited those hooves. Why is it that whales and dolphins have hind limbs, hind limb bones, even though they don't have hind limbs? They have a femur. They even have patellas. They have tibia, fibula, fibula, all the bones in your legs. They've got, but they don't stick out. Why? Well, again, it makes sense. They inherited those genes from a common ancestor. The genes still function, but they're either doing something completely different or they're just non-functional. They just make something. It doesn't really um, uh, do any, anything for or against the creature. So those strange things start making sense if we put things together like this. It also explains why it is that we have design flaws. Why is it that these creatures make hair when they don't have to and have whiskers when they don't have to? It's a design flaw. It's a developmental flaw. Why is it that our knees are so bad with that we have ACL injuries and PCL injuries and all these different knee injuries that other creatures don't seem to have that much? Again, it makes sense because this knee right there, when it's bent like that, is not a bad way of of doing it, not a bad way of designing it. But take that same exact pattern and make it straight like our knee, and that puts way too much pressure on the ligaments, and that's why our ligaments tend to, to, to blow. So if those things are something that is occurring because they are inherited from previous ancestors, that constraint from the way the previous ancestor was made is why it is that we don't come up with optimal designs, and we don't. The designs that are in our body are not optimal. They work, they're good, but we're basically a contraption. And we'll see that in the genes, like I said before. There's lots of broken genes. There's about 
half as many at least genes that are broken from other species in your body as you have functional genes. You have about 25,000 functional genes. There's more than 10,000 genes from other creatures that are broken in you that are not functional. We'll see that when we get to the molecular genetics section. Okay, so if this idea that one species changes into another, changes into another, and we go from a species that walks on land that goes all the way to the whales over a period of tens of millions of years, if that's true, if that's really correct, we should see transitional fossils, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we see fossils that are somehow in between in terms of the traits that they have, Indohyus and Ambulocetus? But they should have the synapomorphic traits, right? We sh they should have an involucrum in their ear, and be at least between here and here, they should have hooves. And the same thing here, we should have other creatures with an involucrum, but also notice, looks like things are changing in a particular way. Looks like the limbs in the hind area are getting more and more reduced. So somewhere we should see transitions where those hind limbs get more and more reduced. Not only that, but we should also see the creatures becoming more and more aquatic. Here we have a creature that probably lived and walked around on the sides of streams, and maybe lakes, and this thing probably swam around in lakes and streams. But this is completely in the water as, is, as are modern whales and dolphins. So we should be seeing transitions uh, that are becoming more and more aquatic just like this. So do we see such things? Yes, yes we do, we have a bunch of them. I'm not even gonna show them all, I'm only gonna show you a few. Here's one called Pachycetus. Its ear bones had an involucrum, it had hooves. And this creature actually had a very, very cetacean-like head and ankle bones, and there's other cetacean characteristics that it had. Now, notice its time period. The earliest Pachycetus fossils are 50 million years ago, Indohyus is 55 million years ago. So that sits right here in the transition between Indohyus and Ambulocetus. Now, between Ambulocetus at 49 million years ago and Bacillosaurus at 41 million years ago, we have a lot of transitional fossils. This one, Myocetus, this good mother whale, was about 47 and a half million years ago. And notice, it's interesting here. You see right there, look carefully right there. You can, you can zoom that in if you need to. There's no obvious sacrum. Now, there's, there's reason to believe, based on anatomical evidence, that the pelvis was still articulated, meaning it's attached in some way to this backbone. But the sacrum is gone, and notice this is a younger fossil. And what would you expect? Would this have hooves or not? Guess what about, what about its ears? It has an involucrum. In fact, all of these creatures have solid involucrums. Okay, what about this? Rhodocetus, here's another one. Same sort of thing. Now here the legs are a little more reduced potentially, but it looks somewhat similar to Myocetus. The skull is quite different. It's definitely a different species, but Rhodocetus existed 47 million years ago. Okay, and Rhodocetus, again, had many, many cetacean characteristics in its skull. It's got an involucrum, and it still had an attached pelvis. Probably, it's hard to tell. Now, here's another one that's been recently found. Per Perigocetus or Perigocetus. 42.6 million years ago. So that puts it between Rhodocetus and Bacillosaurus. And it had cetacean characteristics like these others. It had the involucrum in its ear and, and, and ankle characteristics like, the, like the, the cetaceans and the early cetaceans. And its pelvis was attached. But then there's this guy at 41, the youngest of these new ones. Just before Bacillosaurus. This one's called Georgicetus. Now, Georgicetus, if you look carefully right here, and again, you can blow that up. This pelvis is really tiny, and these legs are very much reduced. They're way bigger than what we see in Bacillosaurus, but they're very, very reduced, and very clearly, they were not attached to this backbone. There's no sacrum. There's no other attachment points. So the legs were free from this creature. What's fascinating about this, given that it has a detached pelvis, and the evidence, of course, is found in all these numbers here are references that you can go look up yourself. This pelvis, if you tried, if this creature tried to lift its body, the pelvis would dislocate. It just doesn't have the structures that are required for it to lift that backbone. And all of these are transitional fossils between Ambulocetus and Bacillosaurus. So that's what we see. And in fact, there's a bunch of others that I haven't shown you here because I didn't have room. We see transitional fossils. What's a fascinating aspect of this, though, is this. Fossilization is rare. The vast majority of species that have ever existed on this planet, we know nothing about because they haven't lived in areas where they could become fossilized. So 
even though we only have a small fraction of the things that have ever existed on the planet, they always end up forming these transitions. Every single one that we find always ends up in the transition between some other fossil. So all of that is evidence that in fact things are changing. And not only do we explain the weird patterns that we saw, the design flaws and all the other things, with the fact that things are changing through time, but we can also see these transitional fossils are supporting that concept. 